Bonova has changed my practice significantly. It's changed from using l joy stents and smaller stents which are dedicated for the arterial system in the past to a more dedicated venous stent. Now this dedicated venous stent is available in longer lengths, greater sizes and has greater radial force which is more appropriate to use in the deep venous system of the iliac veins of the pelvis and the common femoral vein itself. Elgiloy stents and dedicated venous stents, such as the Bar Vinovo, are fairly different animals. The Elgiloy stent originated in the arterial circulation, and typically practitioners employed stents that were much larger diameter in order to generate higher radial force and longer length. So when you transition to a Vinovo, a Bar Vinovo dedicated venous stent, your technique has to change quite considerably. You will, if you decide that you wish to use a stent for a 16 millimeter diameter area, you use the 16 millimeter diameter stent. If you want it to cover 140 millimeters long, you use a 140 millimeter long stent. Whereas with an Elgiloy stent, you typically might use an 1890, for instance, and then try and get it to work to the right diameter. So essentially, there's less guesswork with a, a dedicated venous stent like a barred Vinovo. It's more accurate. For me, the second biggest difference is that positioning is much more precise. It is difficult to land an Elgiloy stent because of the braided stainless steel design. There's a significant amount of foreshortening. And that foreshortening is not present with a barred Vinovo stent. It does what it says in the tin. It is highly accurate and goes pretty much exactly where you want it to go. I think the, the Bard Vinovo stent's an extremely easy stent to use and deploy. Now, the stent itself comes in multiple sizes and lengths. So you have an extremely good range of stents to use in your patient. So whatever diameter that you want to deploy, whether it's a 16, 18, 14, and the length, it could be as short as a 40 millimeter stent, but the Vinovo has the shortest stent available on the market to date. So whether it's 40 or 140 millimetres, whether it's 14 millimetres or 18 millimetres or up to 20 millimetres, you can have any range of stents available to treat your patients. The choice of a stent for a nivel procedure versus a PTS procedure may alter considerably. Nivels, just to refresh it, are, are non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions. And typically their position, say, in the iliac vein compression point where the left common iliac vein is compressed by the right common iliac artery. But there are, as you know, a variety of other different positions best identified with intravascular ultrasound. But typically, whatever the place is, whatever the position is, the nivel lesion will tend to be shorter. So what you want in that stent is you want it to land on the right position. It, your stent needs to be just beyond it and extending a variable distance south of that position or distal. And it needs to achieve adequate diameter at the nivel point, which can be quite severe compression. So by contradistinction, post-thrombotic syndrome patients tend to have a much longer segment of disease and typically extends from the upper left common iliac vein quite often all the way down to the mid common femoral vein. So that can be a distance of 22, 24 centimeters depending upon the height of the patient. And that is where the Bard Vinovo stent system really, really comes into play because there are such a variety of diameters and lengths that you can choose very precisely. You land your first stent accurately, you balloon dilate it, and then you go on to place the second stent with a minimal amount of overlap, perhaps 15 millimeters, which is a considerably shorter amount than you typically use with, for instance, an older Elgiloy stent. The Bard Venovo vernacular trial was a trial uh, FDA um, mandated, 170 patients, prospective, single arm, uh, multiple centers, non-randomized. And it looked at patients with a variety of different conditions, acutes, chronic PTS, and the numbers of each patient group were carefully and strictly controlled by the FDA within certain parameters. So you couldn't, for instance, just do all nivels, which would tend to give you better results, or alternatively do all post-thrombotics, which would give you worse results. So that was very fair on behalf of the FDA to, to come up with the specific numbers of each.
At 12 months, the overall patency for the entire stent population was 88.5% against a literature-derived number of 74%, so clearly far superior. Another striking feature of the trial was the freedom from major adverse events at 94.5% versus a literature derived of 88%. Again, the Bard Vanova exceeded expectations. One of the critical aspects of the trial was that data from the 170 subjects was obtained in each individual hospital, anonymized, and then sent to a core lab for independent adjudication. So there's no doubt whatsoever that the results that you're seeing and that the results that the FDA demanded are independently verified. That's really important to me as a practicing physician that I can trust the data that has been presented to me. A question that is frequently asked is what is the best anticoagulation or antiplatelet regimen post-stenting? And the simple answer is we don't know. There is data from a variety of sources, but a lot of it is arterial, a lot of it is coronary, and it doesn't really apply to the venous circulation. In my own practice, patients with nivels, i.e. non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions, I'm quite happy with three months of antiplatelet therapy. So for me, that is in the form of aspirin, 75 milligrams a day. Um, it has not been proven, but it seems to do okay. That is borne out in the studies not just with the Bard Venovo stent, but with a variety of other stent platforms, that the patency in this stent population in nivel patients is extremely high. So it's quite likely that your anticoagulation or antiplatelet regimen is not that important. In post-thrombotic patients, your anticoagulation protocol is very important. And I think the lessons that I've learned would be that you need the patient fully anticoagulated before, during, and after the procedure. And that anticoagulation cannot vary a whole lot. So I think it's important that the patient comes in fully loaded. I think during the procedure, you need to measure their ACT, and it needs to be 200 to 250 seconds, which is far longer uh, than and a far higher level of anticoagulation than most people have hitherto been using. Post-procedure, you need to start the anticoagulation as soon as the patient is getting off the table. And this is a lesson I've learned many times. If you rely on others to give the anticoagulation that evening, you may fail. So we insist on giving the anticoagulation ourselves by means of low molecular weight heparin injection before they leave my lab. And then I make sure that they get their anticoagulation that evening. So maintenance of anticoagulation is critical postoperatively in the post-thrombotic group. And it is critical that that anticoagulation does not dip at any time. So you need to assess the patient and make sure they understand the importance of that. So there's a piece of education there to explain to the patient just how important anticoagulation is after the procedure. They probably think that the stent is a panacea and that they may not need to take their anticoagulation. And I've learned from bitter experience that you need full anticoagulation before, during, and afterwards. Are you treating a nivel patient or post-thrombotic patient? And the nivel patients are quite easy because you just have to identify the areas of compression and treat that with the stent, whether it's a short stent or a longer stent if there's several areas of compression. The post-thrombotic syndrome patients are a little bit more difficult. And I think in this situation, you actually need to use IVUS to get a successful result. You need to identify where you have a good patent vessel with minimal disease and treat that vessel from good vessel to good vessel, and that may be a longer stent or a shorter stent, but without that information, you will not obtain the result that you want. You'll actually probably deploy the stent within the venous uh, previously diseased vessel and come up with a suboptimal result and a thrombosis. So I think use IVUS to deploy your stent, and you can rely on the Bard Venovo stent and if it's sized appropriately and you place it from good vessel to good vessel, the result you want will be easily obtained. For me, the keys to success in deploying the Bard Venovo venous stent are several. Adequate preoperative imaging to identify what area is diseased. Use of intravascular ultrasound during the procedure to confirm the areas because it's often quite different to what you think from preoperative imaging. Adequate vessel prep with pre-dilatation. For me, the Bard Atlas balloon is the king, and I balloon dilate the nominal diameter of the stent you are going to place. I do that to high pressure, 
and I do it pre-stent deployment and post-stent deployment. Then we use intravascular ultrasound to confirm that the stent is fully opposed to the wall. As my colleague, Dr. Dubinek, has indicated, identification of the best inflow is essential, particularly in your post-thrombotic patients where the disease may extend not just down into the common femoral, but even beyond into the femoral or profunda. Identifying which of those veins is dominant is key. Like all surgical procedures, there is uh, attention to detail and adequate anticoagulation is critical as well.